so what, what we're going to do now that over the next mine and the next series of um, of conversations is going to be we're going to teach you about blockchain like how the technology works right so a lot of the stuff up, up until now was how can you use it what are the use cases because we wanted you, we wanted you to understand why what we're about to show you is important so we're going to start with the basic bitcoin protocol then uh, then Eugene and a number of others are going to come up and talk uh, actually uh, Brian's going to come up and talk about uh, uh, permission blockchains and some of the enterprise ones and then Eugene and I'm not sure if Paul uh, hopefully, hopefully can join us uh, we'll talk about advanced uh, protocols. So, so, um, so that's where we're going to go. All right, let's, uh, oh, I got the clicker. Awesome. All right, so the first thing that's important to understand is that, that blockchain is a protocol. So let me just explain that, right? The internet is a protocol, and all that means is it's a common language that all of our computers use to talk to each other, right? And, and that's all. Blo um, block, uh, it, the internet is a protocol about peer-to-peer uh, -peer sharing of information, right? Blockchain is about the the peer-to-peer the -peer sharing of value. And when we talk about value, I just want to go back to a ledger, right? If you put your money in a bank, all they're doing is essentially they're recording it in a ledger, and, and all they're doing is determining who owns what. So, so blockchain is, is essentially just a ledger, and we'll talk about it being distributed and, and things like that. But it's a protocol about how these different com, uh, computers talk to each other. Um, so... Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through uh, some of these slides, but these are just uh, just sort of a review. <clears throat> All right, now oh, moving a little too fast. Um, it's important to understand the difference between sort of the centralized, distributed, and the decentralized. Right? Here's the most important thing to understand uh, about decentralized. If there's an admin that can change the data, it's not decentralized. It might be distributed. Right? You might have a situation where I'm, I've got data and I'm copying it onto a lot of different places, but if the control of that data is in one place, and, there's, and think about this, if you've got a blockchain and all of your nodes uh, are on the Microsoft cloud or the AWS cloud, right? can anybody control, is, can somebody control that data? Can they shut it down? Right. <clears throat> so. When we think about distributed, decentralized, what makes Bitcoin um, you know, so different than essentially a, a private permission blockchain where all of the nodes are uh, you know, <clears throat> controlled by a single entity is you, you can't shut down Bitcoin. There's, I, I, don't, I think the numbers are like two and a half million different nodes on all sorts of different platforms, and, right? Uh, so that, that's an important consideration is, is where are there, those nodes and, and who controls them? It's important to understand there's some advantages and de disadvantages uh, in, in terms of centralized and, and decentralized. So s for some of you who may know uh, something about, about my, my background, uh, I spent a number of years in the military, in Army, Infantry, and Intelligence, right? And um, the military is very efficient, right? When the commander says, go take that hill, you know, his subordinates don't say, well, wait a minute, let's talk about this, let's come to consensus, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, Congress doesn't operate the same way the military does. Right? Now, you guys, you know what the opposite of Congress is, right? Progress. <laughs> All right, but here's the deal. Centralized is very fast, very efficient, so we'll talk about proof of stake and other types of architectures, because if you do become highly decentralized, it's also much harder to be fast, right? A commander can make a decision quickly, a group, it takes more time. So there's definitely some performance considerations, and a lot of folks have done some really innovative work about how you can be decentralized and fast. That, that'll be covered a little bit later. We're going to talk a little bit about encryption. <clears throat> and um, hey, uh, Jordan, um, Jordan's not here. When I get to the slide on the, um, when I get to one of the slides, can you play a video? If I can find it. It, it's, it's one of the links on the, uh, one of the things. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about encryption uh, a, a little bit later. And the other just sort of concept I want to get into before we get into how the blockchain protocol works is the concept, concept of an authentication. Hey, Jordan. Yeah. When I get to the slide on the SHA-256, can, can you click the uh, thing and share that on Awesome. You're a rock star. All right. <clears throat> so if we think about a notary public, right, that's, that's essentially an authenticator, right? We're going to talk a little bit about how that's done in the Bitcoin thing. Um, You'll also hear the term proof of work. You'll hear proof of stake, proof of work. One of the criticisms you'll hear about Bitcoin is, oh, it's proof of work, that's bad. 
right? It uses too much energy, it's bad for the environment. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but all proof of work means is that you have to do some work in order to get past this step, right? And it was really originally designed to stop um, denial of service attacks. So if I didn't like Brian's website and I would send a bazillion messages at that website to knock it down, right, um, that would be a bad thing. So Brian could put up a proof of work uh, wall in front of me. So in order for me to get to his server, my computer has to do some work, right? It's really to sort of slow it down to make me have to really do some effort to cost me something in order to get through, right? And, and the Bitcoin protocol uses this concept of, of proof of work. It's called, it, it's different than a CAPTCHA in that it's done by a computer as opposed to a person. All right, this is one of my favorite um, parts of, the, of this whole thing. We gotta talk about a hash. The hash is one of the fundamental concepts in, in blockchain. And what a hash is, it's just a function. Think of it like an equation, right? And all a hash says is, I'm gonna take data of some kind of variable length and size and type, and I'm gonna convert it into a fixed known, fixed, fixed size, uh, fixed format. Anybody ever use Bitly? You guys know what, or, or any kind of web, website shortener? All that is is an equation. When you type in www.aol.com or washingtonpost.com, it's gonna take those that URL, and it's gonna use a, an equation to convert it into something that's shorter, right? That's kind of what a, a hash function does. It says, regardless of what you put in, I'm gonna convert it to something of a fixed size in a, a fixed format. So for example, I could take these, uh, th these things on the left, run it through a hash function, and if my hash function said, hey, give me a three-digit output, doesn't matter what I put in, I'm gonna get a, a three-digit output coming out. Doesn't matter whether it's an image, I don't care. As long as it's data, it's gonna, it's gonna convert. Now, the, the hash algorithm that Bitcoin uses is called a SHA-256. And what that means is I don't care what you put on the, on the input side. Oh, but that's for me telling I'm busy. Um, I don't care what you're gonna put on the input side. When, um, when it comes out, it's gonna be 256 bits, right? A bit is basically a one or a zero, right? And, and it's gonna be in what's called a hexadecimal for, format. So it's gonna be A through F, zero through eight, right? Now I'm gonna explain uh, why this is so uh, important. Hang on just a second. So uh, it's really secure. I'm gonna explain, explain kind of how and why in a second, but I want you to understand how, this is the same technology we use for digital signatures. And I wanna give you an idea of exactly how secure the SHA-256 algorithm is, Jordan? So, so while they're trying to get that, that set up, I'll tell you just a couple other things about uh, the SHA-256 alg algorithm. So number one, it's, um, it's one way, meaning uh, it uses something like divide by zero or something like that so that um, I can put an input in and I get an output. And every time I put an, an input in, it's gonna get that exact same output, but I can't back it up, I can't reverse it. I can't reverse engineer. So if I was gonna take the phrase, uh, uh, Jack and Jill went up the hill, run it through a SHA-256 algorithm, I get some numbers and letters. There's no way I can look at those numbers and letters and figure out that the input was Jack and Jill went up the hill, right? That's, that's one attribute. Um, the other attribute about it is um, um, it's, oh, are you just looking for, it's blue, oh, is that it? In the main video on yeah, cryptocurrencies, I made this. two references to situations where in order to break a given piece of security, you would have to guess a specific string of 256 bits. One of these was in the context of digital signatures, and the other in the context of a cryptographic hash function. For example, if you want to find a message whose SHA-256 hash is some specific string of 256 bits, you have no better method than to just guess and check random messages. And this would require, on average, 2 to the 256 guesses. Now this is a number so far removed from anything that we ever deal with that it can be hard to appreciate its size. But let's give it a try. 2 to the 256 is the same as 2 to the 32 multiplied by itself 8 times. Now what's nice about that split is that 2 to the 32 is 4 billion, which is at least a number we can think about, right? It's the kind of thing you might see in a headline. So all we need to do is appreciate what multiplying 4 billion times itself 8 successive times really feels like. As many of you know, the GPU on your computer can let you run a whole bunch of computations in parallel incredibly quickly. 
So if you were to specially program a GPU to run a cryptographic hash function over and over, a really good one might be able to do a little less than a billion hashes per second. And let's say that you just take a bunch of those and cram your computer full of extra GPUs so that your computer can run 4 billion hashes per second. So the first 4 billion here is going to represent the number of hashes per second per computer. Now, picture 4 billion of these GPU-packed computers. For comparison, even though Google does not at all make their number of servers public, estimates have it somewhere in the single digit millions. In reality, most of those servers are gonna be much less powerful than our imagined GPU packed machine. But let's say that Google replaced all of its millions of servers with a machine like this, then four billion machines would mean about a thousand copies of this souped up Google. Let's call that one kilogoogle worth of computing power. There's about 7.3 billion people on Earth. So next, imagine giving a little over half of every individual on Earth their own personal kilogoogle. Now, imagine 4 billion copies of this Earth. For comparison, the Milky Way has somewhere between 100 and 400 billion stars. We don't really know, but the estimates tend to be in that range. So this would be akin to a full 1% of every star in the galaxy having a copy of Earth where half the people on that Earth have their own personal kilogoogle. Next, try to imagine four billion copies of the Milky Way. And we're gonna call this your gigagalactic supercomputer, running about two to the 160 guesses every second. Now, four billion seconds, that's about 126.8 years. Four billion of those, well, that's 507 billion years, which is about 37 times the age of the universe. So even if you were to have your GPU-packed kilogoogle per person multiplanetary gigagalactic computer guessing numbers for 37 times the age of the universe, it would still only have a 1 in 4 billion chance of finding the correct guess. By the way, the state of Bitcoin hashing these days is that all of the miners put together guess and check at a rate of about 5 billion billion hashes per second. That corresponds to one third of what I just described as a kilogoogle. This is not because there are actually billions of GPU packed machines out there, but because miners actually use something that's about a thousand times better than a GPU, application specific integrated circuits. These are pieces of hardware specifically designed for Bitcoin mining, for running a bunch of SHA-256 hashes and nothing else. Turns out there's a lot of- He's up, he talks a little bit about he talks a little bit about his channel after that. It's, it's a, a great, if you like math, great uh, uh, series. So, um, so it is possible, right? Um, so when we talk about the security and people say, well, Bitcoin is not secure, I want you to understand what it, what it, the kind of security that we're uh, talking about. Can you uh, take me to the back of the slide presentation? Okay. Um, so a SHA-256, uh, a hash algorithm allows you to take any input and you can convert it into one of those series of numbers and letters uh, and you have essentially two to two, the 256 uh, different guesses. All right. Um, okay. So a couple of principles. So hashes are unique. So one input always equals one output, right? You'll never, you know, I'll never put Jack and Jill went up the hill and get one shot uh, output and put something else and get that same shot output. It'll never happen, right? There, like I said, there one way. I like this particular uh, drawing, right? <clears throat> uh, the only way you can figure it out is to guess and check. It's referred to as using brute force. So if you wanted to break the encryption, you would just have to guess and check that many times with that much computing power times 37 times the, uh, the age of the universe. They're completely patternless. So. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't basically put two inputs and look at the show outputs and have any kind of a relationship. They're, they're totally random, right? And so those are just a quick recap. They're, they're one way, they're totally random, and they're unique. Now, let's, um, let's talk about how all this relates to um, the blockchain. So I can take a message, and if, uh, you know, I, I might say that, that uh, Gerard sent Jordan 10 Bitcoins on February 1st, right? That's going to give me a, I'm, I'm going to convert that into a, into a, a SHA output, right? And um, 
And so now I want to talk. I want to. I want to back up on something I said. I saw. I said that you can only have one input to one output, but you can do something called blending them. And here's what I mean. I can take any of the characters on your right, and I can I can essentially turn it into a, a Shaw output, right? But I can take those three at the top and put them in and blend them into an, a, another one, and then I can blend them again so that one Shaw output that you see all the way on your right essentially is a, is a summary of all of those inputs. Now, if I make any change, if I take one of those circles and take the dot out and put a little X in there, it radically changes that, the Shaw output, which radically changes the next one and the next one, and it ripples through the system. Do you guys understand that so far? Right? So if I have that Shaw output, if we all have the same Shaw output, but, um, but Kathy out there, her Shaw output is different than the rest of ours, that means somebody's tampered with her data. We don't know how they tampered, we don't know what's been tampered, but that number is different, so we would just sit, simply reject it. We'd say, I'm sorry, that doesn't, that doesn't work. And this is how consensus is developed. So we basically make a claim about what's happening on, on the ledger. We all get a copy of it. If anything is out of whack, if anybody corrupts it in any way, right, that, that output would be different. So I want to move into this. So if we look at a block in a blockchain, all of those lines represent different transactions. And those transactions are summarized into a summary hash. So if anybody tampers with any transaction in that block, that summary block essentially is inconsistent with the rest of ours. And I'm going to slide through this. Okay. So when we look at a blockchain, and each of these blocks are a set of transactions in the database, I'm sorry, in the, in the blockchain, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to include a hash of the previous block. So let's say we're on, uh, on block 10,000, and somebody made a change to one of the transactions in block one. Do you see how that would ripple through the entire blockchain, and now, that, now my most recent block essentially is inconsistent? So the, the, the value of the previous hash is if I decide to join the blockchain, I don't have to have the history of every transaction since Satoshi Nakamoto was a, was a, a gleam in his mother's eye, right? All I have to have is the hash of the most recent block, right? Now, let's talk about some of the things that are specifically in this, and let's talk about how proof of work comes in. So in every block, I'm going to have a couple things. I'm going to have a hash of the previous block. I'm going to have a summary of all of the transactions in that block. I'm going to have a date timestamp. And I'm going to have something called a nonce. Here's where proof of work comes in. Uh, you'll hear people say, well, what the miners have to do, and the miners are the ones that validate the transactions. The miner has to guess a value to put in the nonce. So the output of that SHA-256 uh, hash, if I hash together the the previous block, the summary of all of the transactions, the date timestamp, and the nonce, some number I'm going to guess, if, if, if the output is four leading zeros, then I win. Right? Now, what's the likelihood that I'm going to guess a number or I'm going to guess a value to put in the nonce, and the first time I do it, there's going to be four leading zeros? High or low? Low. So I guess again. What, what's the likelihood? Slightly higher. <laughs> Slightly higher, but not much, right? So I continue to guess and check. And when I guess and check, I'll, uh, eventually, somebody's going to put a, a value in the nonce that when they put all that together, they're going to get four leading zeros. And at that point, they raise their hand and they say, hey, I figured it out. If we take this hash of the previous block, these transactions, the date timestamp, and this number that I just guessed, or this value I just guessed, we get four leading zeros. Right? And everybody says, check, they all check it. Again, hard to guess, easy to check. And then they raise their hand and they say, yep, we all agree. And then we all take a copy of that block and add that to our copy of the blockchain. And that's how the new blocks get added. Now, you might hear that uh, a block gets added on the Bitcoin blockchain every 10 minutes. Right? Well, if this is all done on random, how can we say it's going to happen every 10 minutes? That's because the difficulty of the challenge, which is basically the number of leading zeros, 
automatically adjust up or down depending on how many miners, you know, how many miners are mining, what the competition is. So when a number of miners drop out of the mining uh, activities, right, there are fewer miners, then the challenge becomes easier. And when lots of miners come in, the challenge becomes harder. So that on average, a block gets mined every 10 minutes. Let's talk about energy for a second. One of the, one of the criticisms you'll hear is, oh, this uses so much electricity. Well, what, what you have to understand is miners are in this thing to make money, right? And so the number of miners that are going to be mining is going to be a function of a couple things. It's all related to how much money are they going to make. If it's going to cost me to mine, I'm getting out of the business. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at the price of Bitcoin. I'm going to look at how difficult it is. I'm going to look at the co my cost of electricity. Um, and that's pretty much it. Right? So uh, if I'm a miner, am I going to mine in places where you know, electricity is not ubiquitous. It's not the same everywhere, right? In some places it's abundant and cheap. In other places it's rare and expensive. I'm going to go mine in places where it is abundant and cheap, right? If the price of Bitcoin goes up or down, right, I may pull out of the market. But this is a self-regulating system, right? So when people talk about it uses so much electricity, uh, it, it's not exactly a, uh, uh, it's, it, it's a very sort of sophomoric understanding, right? Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. Oh, <laughs> yes, me. Go next slide. Okay, I sure will. <laughs> all right, now what we just talked about was uh, the blockchain, but all of that, va all that value is hashed, so you, there's, you don't know what the numbers are, all you know are the hashes. Along with that is something called a transaction database. And so, the, what the blockchain does is it just says, hey, you can trust the information. The transaction database is essentially who own, essentially um, what addresses have how many Bitcoins, right? And without getting into a lot of detail, so every time you spend a, a, a Bitcoin, you basically move it from one address to another, okay? <clears throat> and then uh, the blockchain gets replicated across the whole network. We come to consensus. And move a little fast because we're. And so here's so here's the thing: if if there's 250 million uh, uh, miners out there, or 250 million nodes, um, and I want to hack the system, here's what I got to do: I've got to create a false record, right? And I have to convince all of the miners in the world that my record is accurate and complete in under 10 minutes, because in about 10 minutes the next block gets mined, and i got to figure it out all over again, right? So the more miners there are, the more difficult it is to hack. So in a, in a protocol like this, right, you know, the, the, the concept of cybersecurity is, hey, <clears throat> don't put the information everywhere, put it in one place, put these big walls around it, don't let anybody get in. Only need to know, right? Here we say, you really want to secure it, put it everywhere, right? And the more places you have it, the more secure the data is, the harder it is to hack. So it's an entirely different paradigm on, on cybersecurity. All right, <clears throat> that's, um, that's uh, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the Bitcoin protocol. Thoughts, questions? Yep. I've stunned them. <laughs> Either that or they're sleeping, I don't know. Is that helpful? Good. Yeah. Hold on. Gerard, I got one back here. Don't clap yet. It's, it's not that good yet. And then Josh has got a question after, after him. Hey, Gerard. Thank you. Um, I, again, I don't represent um, my company, but I work for Lighthouse. I'm just here for my own um, understanding. I just wanted to make sure I understood you correctly with respect to the hashing. Is it is it possible that as there are more hashes and that increases, that like it can add a block without solving it? Or did I misunderstand that? No, IBM said, uh, <laughs> no, um, <clears throat> no, uh, can you give, give me my hand. Can you repeat the question again because uh, I want to make sure that I answer it correctly. Yeah, I'm still kind of new to this. I was just trying to understand that, like, as there are more miners, it's harder to solve. But if you have a fixed time of 10 minutes to add a block, how does, I was trying to understand how that would work. Like, does it have to be solved for the block to be added, or are there Got scenarios it. where it Got doesn't it. Okay. get yeah, solved? So let me, let me, all right. <clears throat> so uh, if all of, 
uh, if all of us were minors, right, and we were all essentially doing a random activity, right, in other words, guessing and checking what the correct hash is or what the correct nonce is, um, every, the longer we do it, the more we can come up with a statistical average on how long it would take us to do it, right? Right, it's just kind of like insurance and actuary tables, right? So, um, so if I said that it is, it, let's say we have three levels of difficulty, right? Easy, medium, and hard. If I made the difficulty medium, and we're all guessing and checking, and let's say after a period of time we get an average of, we're all, we're all guessing uh, medium difficulty, and we find it, it generally takes us about 15 minutes to, uh, to guess and check, right? Sometimes it might be two, sometimes 20, but on average, all of us over a period of time, it's gonna take 15 minutes. And I say, I, I, want the block, I want this to happen every 10 minutes. So now I change the difficulty to hard, right? And so now it's taking this all uh, even longer, right? You know, however the numbers work out. So it's really about um, the harder I make it, the longer it takes on average across the whole population. The easier I make it, the less time it takes. And so I can adjust the easiness or hardness so that I get it to about 10 minutes. Every block's not mined in exactly 10 minutes. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a rough average. Yeah, uh, Josh had a question over here. Thank you. My name is Joshua Hakaki, and I work for the National Artificial Intelligence Institute. Uh, I work Department for the Natural, Natural Intelligence Institute. No. Well, thank you. Um, Department of Veterans Affairs. So my question is, and it may be beyond the scope of a, a brief um, demonstration, but in my in one of the recent lectures that I was viewing online, they briefly go into orphan blocks, but they don't describe the you know the the why and how they're created or abandoned. Gotcha. Is that something maybe you could yeah? Uh, it's touch it's on? really not that not not that difficult. So if you think about it, you've got miners all over the world that are mining blocks, right? Um, one person might guess and guess a nonce that, that would result in three or four leading zeros um, uh, here, here in, uh, where, in Washington, D.C. And somebody else in Sydney, Australia might at about the same time, right? But because of delays in the internet and everything's not the same, that may propagate across the network at slightly different rates. So it could be that, that there's a block and then two miners essentially have, uh, have mined the next block. And, and what the miners do is, there's a bunch of pending transactions. They go there, they, they scoop up the pending transactions, put them into a block, you know, do the work that we talked about, and, and come up with an option. And so it's possible that two miners at about the same time might, might have mined a subsequent block. So now you have what's referred to as, it's a soft fork, right? So now you've got, got a bunch of miners that are connecting to block A and a bunch of miners that are connecting to block B, right? And so the rule in the algorithm is you always connect to the longest chain. What that means is along the way, you may have a couple little stubs or orphans that are not part of the main um, block, but they're still, they're still completely valid. Uh, actually, Brian is even more of an expert than I am. So Brian, you. So, yeah, so using, using the example that he was sharing with you. So what happens is, is that when a transaction happens, it's broadcast to the network. But given the size of the earth and the time it takes for things to happen, um, that pool of queued transactions doesn't are not identical. So let's say one is in China, one is here in the U.S. Um, the the pool of transactions in China might have, say, ten thousand, for argument's sake, and the pool in in the United States has ten thousand and fifty. But what happens is is that the pool that the block uh, miner is mining in China happens first. So what happens to that extra 50 transactions? Since it wasn't a part of that pool, they're orphaned. And it's the same thing as if they didn't happen. So they're not valid transactions anymore because they were not a part of a block. Now you can re-issue re them and revalidate them and then try to get them into the next block, but that's what happens. That's how you end up with an orphaned transaction. Got it. So, see, I, thank you, because now I learned something. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think uh, I'm out of time, but hope, hope you guys got something out of that, out of that lesson. And now we're going to learn about enterprise blockchain from the guy who's smarter about this than I am.
All right, thank you, Gerard.